Hey everybody, this is Aaron the Pedantic. Today I'm going to go over Dungeon Crawl Classics Frozen in Time. So this is a level one adventure by Michael Curtis. This is not going to be an in-depth guide, but rather a review. Basically, what are you getting with this product? Is it worth it? Those kinds of questions. So uh, I'm reviewing the PDF because it's easier for you to be able to read what exactly I'm showing and see all of that. Uh, my physical setup is just not that great. Um, but uh, I this one, actually, this one I do not own in print also. So there is that there is that whole thing. But I probably will purchase at some point because I do think that it is a very cool module and I would love to run it uh, at the game store. So here we go. Now, obviously, you have some very cool cover art here, and it tells you exactly what you're in for. You have this very frigid-looking place. You have uh, some prehistoric individuals that are being manhandled by this giant robot. And uh, then you have a standard DCC-looking character-ish kind of thing going on. Um, now you'll notice here that it says that there is a mini campaign setting included with this. So this is probably not something that was uh, originally in the um, Frozen in Time module. It's probably a new addition. They've been doing that with uh, various modules of theirs that are particularly popular, uh, which is cool. I think it's really cool. It may mean that it costs a little bit more as well though. So uh, just keep that in mind now. Uh, so here we have one of the first maps that you're going to see. This is the interior once they actually get into the place through one of the tubes. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the maps, as always, have a lot of style and art and all those kinds of things included. You get a really good uh, picture of how exactly these things look. As you can see, it's uh, isometric and you can, you can see in kind of like third dimension uh, what exactly is going on in the room. Um, not so much with this one. This was uh, this is 2D, but it's got some 3D effects to kind of show you that, uh, that these lifts are functioning. Uh, here you have an interior art that is displaying a potential scene that can erupt, which is always fun whenever they have these because whenever it happens and you can you can take the take a moment to just show to the players what exactly it is that they're encountering, so they can be like, oh, you know. And usually the art is just really cool. I mean, they look. Uh, ter that one looks like t terrified, like I'm not messing with that. <laughs> but, um, you know, really to say that uh, DCC art is good is kind of redundant at this point because it's always good. So uh, here you have the very typical introduction thing that they always do, describing what exactly you're looking for. So it is a an adventure designed for six level one characters, which is a pretty substantial size party. Um, you know, a lot of people play maybe four to four to five players. So, uh, you may want to let somebody play an additional character if at all possible. I actually did let that happen. Um, I just randomly rolled to see who would get to do that. And so he did. Now, what is, what is this place? Basically what this place is, is the hideaway of a time traveler who buried his hideaway deep inside a glacier. The glacier has, uh, cracked open. And basically some local barbarian tribes are disturbed by it, but they're forbidden to go in investigate it themselves. At least that's the adventure from the standard format that you would be looking at. So the barbarians are going to seek people of civilization and they're going to offer them some nice little rewards. Now, if I could offer any kind of quote unquote criticism, uh, with this, it might be that I would like to have seen specified exactly how much is being rewarded or how, 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 what, are, what exactly is the value of the goods that they're willing to offer. Um, really, it just says as much as a single man can carry and it is left to the judge. There are a lot of things in here that are left to the judge, which is fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I always tend to like having a little bit of guidance, especially whenever it is an official uh, product from, you know, the people that made the system. And that way I can kind of get a bit of a gauge as to how much, you know, people should be getting for things, uh, ish, you know, the, it, it can be kind of hard to tell, like with economy and all that kind of stuff. Now I will say that as far as DCC goes, uh, and it, with the inherent system, there's not a whole lot to spend for them to spend their gold on. Anyway, you don't buy magic items. You don't buy, 
uh, a lot of that stuff, that's all going to be up to the judge anyway. So it, it makes sense, I suppose. Now, there is the option that instead of just being level one adventurers that are brought here, you could begin as tribesmen. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But basically, it is another way to do it. And it will ultimately change the way that the adventure is being approached in some few ways. For the most part, there's still people fumbling around with technology that is way beyond them and with languages that they can't comprehend being spoken. Uh, that does mean that the players are not going to be able to learn much if they don't have the uh, comprehend languages spell in their repertoire. So that means that they're not going to learn a whole lot about what exactly is going on in this place. There really isn't much opportunity for that. Um, even if they do understand that, they're still not going to know exactly. They're, they're, they're just some little um, things here and there that are offered. So what I would suggest is that if you do run this and you have a player who has the comprehend languages spell, maybe have a terminal that, that is uh, uh, going to give a little bit of the, the information for the background of this place, because that may be something that could further draw them into the location. Now, my party did not have that, and they still had a great time, and they thought that it was a really cool place. So it's not exactly 100% necessary. Now, they always have these little encounter tables, and this is no different. As you can see, it's not there's not a whole lot of encounters. There are no random encounters. That's pretty standard for DCC modules for the most part. Uh, instead, what you have are these are the things that are in this room, and this triggers after they enter the room, which I have mixed feelings about. Um, the way that people tend to run DCC, I think that it works fine. Uh, I tend to be more of a simulationist bent, but you know, I still have to accept the conceit that the module begins whenever they get there. So um, it's really just a further extension of that, and I may just be a puritanical asshole. So uh, whenever they first arrive, they're going to be at a glacier that they have to climb. It is quite substantial, and they have the option to just climb as high as uh, they need to in order to enter a hole in the side, which is actually uh, an exhaust port with um, two different tubes that they can go into, or they can climb to the top and then find another entrance that will actually get them in a little bit uh, faster, uh, let them bypass some stuff, but it is a lot more dangerous to get there. Um, if they, they can go, they can climb directly up. It is dangerous that way, or they can climb, they can go around on some goat paths, which is going to make them encounter a saber toothed ice bear, which is quite vicious. Now, uh, once they get in, this place is a vault and if they take the tubes, they're basically going to go to the same place, um, which, you know, it's. It makes sense for the way that this place is built, at least from the way that the diagrams and the maps depict it. Uh, but it really kind of makes the left or right choice pointless and don't let them agonize over it because it really doesn't matter. They're still getting going to get in the same room and they're still going to encounter the same stuff, which is, again, something that I'm not a particular fan of, but that's OK. Uh, there are some side tunnels that they can go through that can lead to some different ways out, but ultimately they're still going to get into the same room for the most part. Whenever they go in through the tubes, they're going to encounter these boar bugs and they're these basically these two foot long centipedes and they have a kind of a neat way of fighting. They either headbutt you with their super hot bones or they can, uh, actually, I think that that's what they, I think that's what they do. Uh, or they can bite you. Yeah, they can bite you. The uh, the ramming, a little bit more powerful, but a little bit less likely to hit. So it's kind of a neat little thing. It's it's just a cool detail. I like it. So anyway, uh, once they work their way into the facility, you have all kinds of stuff going wrong here. Basically, the power to the place is being lost. Not only is the great the glacier cracking, but this whole place is about to explode and they don't know it yet. So there are certain things that are powered on. There are certain things that are not powered on. And a lot of their navigation through this place is going to be understanding how it works and how to navigate it. Like, for instance, there are these lift tubes that they're going to be navigating through that are in various states of activity. Some of them require that you push a button to make it work. Some of them uh, don't have power. 
and the only way to navigate them is to climb up them, which is again, dangerous. And that is their primary way of traversing through this place. There are a few doors that are not wanting to open and they're gonna have to exert their strength in order to make it happen. Uh, there is, there's just a lot of stuff going on in this place. Um, now, if I had to render any criticism here, it is that the exploration bits can be a little bit lengthy without a whole lot happening just because um, there's just, there's just not, not a whole terribly lot happening unless they interact with certain things. Like for instance, if they don't interact with the uh, various consoles in the place, then they're not going to deal with this uh, malfunctioning table right here, which is a shame because it's pretty cool. But you know, it's just a matter of, do you want to mess with the blinking lights and buttons? No? Okay. Well, I guess we'll carry on then. So uh, it is cool that they have, have it though. Absolutely. So that is, there's a neat feature that they do have that table to determine what happens whenever they mess with the little buttons. Uh, so this place has a ton of hazards all over the place. And of course, I love that. This place is quite deadly if they choose to mess with things. Uh, now, one of the things that they're going to encounter are these little gold or silver palm discs. Most of the doors are gonna be inaccessible until they get the silver one. The silver one is going to let them open the doors that are locked. Um, the gold one is going to let them open the remaining doors that are locked, but they won't get that until they're quite, quite well into this. Uh, there is a Yeti in this that they will encounter that is injured. And I would say it's important to try and telegraph this. I did try to telegraph this to the players, um, but they really didn't uh, care. <laughs> so they they just beat the ever-loving hell out of the Yeti and it died. But if they manage to heal the thing, then it can be consoled into being um, complacent. Uh, with magic and healed, it'll befriend the party and follow them as long as they still stay within their its preferred climate, which is cool. So the fact that we do have a mini campaign setting here means that potentially they could have a an NPC friend, that companion that will stay with them for the campaign until they leave, which is cool. Um, I love whenever you have those kinds of situations where if they try to be diplomatic, then they can be rewarded for their efforts. So there are some things of value that they can find at this place. I'd say that it's not as uh, treasure heavy as some locations may be, especially with regard to gold and silver. In fact, there's almost everything that you're going to find here that's of value is going to be actually um, trinkets and equipment of various types rather than strictly gold and, and, and um, silver and copper and stuff like that. Uh, it makes sense for what this place is. This is a time traveler's estate. He's not going to be too terribly concerned probably with the, uh, the, the currencies of the current era that the, the, the players are going to be partaking in. So it makes perfect sense. Um, they're not going to be leaving with a ton of treasure as far as stuff that they can sell and get a whole big haul out of. It's pretty much going to be the stuff that they get from the, uh, the, the prehistoric individuals. Um, that being said, they will find some cool stuff and there is a lot of fun, uh, interactions that can happen with you trying to explain to the players, uh, which actually the boxed text is going to offer, um, in its own language, but you're trying to explain to the players these rather modern things that they're going to find that are going to be bizarre to them, such as these strange uh, synthetic um, uh, silverware and things like that, which of course we know to be plastic. <laughs> um, you have uh, lots of modern art pieces you know, or at least our world art pieces that are going to be included, such as the thinker or Michelangelo's David that they can find and take back to civilization and sell. But unfortunately, 
um, most people are probably not going to appreciate them that much out in the world where they're going to be sold. So um, you have some guidance as to how much they'll probably uh, fetch at a large town or city. It's not too terribly much, but there, again, there are some pretty neat things that they will find as long as they go to the right place, which they probably will. Actually, they, they just about certainly will. I'm quite sure. It's possible that they won't, but they probably will. So they will uh, find the silver thing and then they will find the gold one in the room where the guy who owns this place died of death and died of death, died of old, old age and disease. So um, basically they'll find it in his hand. There is, this is one thing that I really appreciated is this little medical drone, which attacks the party and it attacks them, but it's actually trying to heal them. <laughs> Whoever is most injured first, it's going to try and stick them with a needle. And it does not proc very easily. It's got a minus two to hit. And if it does stick them, then it's going to heal them. So it's pretty amusing because uh, in my game, what happened was uh, they were swinging at it. Uh, the halfling grabbed the pillowcase from the bed and then uh, trapped the, the drone in the pillowcase, and then they beat it like a pinata. And uh, they eventually collected the serum from it, but I don't think that they ever uh, learned that it heals them. In any case, uh, next you have the treasury. So the treasury is a very cool place. So the treasury is where they're gonna find that big robot uh, that you see on the cover. And you know the advice here is basically that it can be whatever robot from whatever your favorite sci-fi movie is, but they have Bobby the robot and it's gonna, if they have comprehend languages, they'll be able to hear warning, warning, Bill Robertson, um, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as far as what it, what that robot is guarding, this is, this is the real treasure hoard here. So you have some fields uh, of like basically you have energy fields that will protect these things. Some of them are down because the power is in different states. Some of them are flickering, uh, which require checks in order to grab whatever the thing is and not get shocked and possibly damaged by the thing. And some of them are up. And it specifically says though, that as far as the ones that are up, there is nothing that they can do to change that. Now, I'm not a fan of that in particular. Um, I personally like it whenever there are some ways, but you could just say that it's such sufficient, sufficiently high technology that there just is really no way to bypass without having some way of uh, hacking or something like that. Um, yeah, that's... That's my own personal take on it. I, I would I would like to have seen that, you know, that if if they're basically if they beat on the the stuff enough that they might be able to find a way to break it open and make it a time thing. But here's the thing, they don't have random encounters on here. Time is only going to be a factor whenever you make it one, which uh, is going to be basically whenever you feel like is appropriate. I'll get to that in a minute. But there are a lot of really cool things that they're going to find there. Some of them are standard equipment from different eras, and they just have some flowery language about them. They There is a blaster that has a very limited amount of shots, and uh, it could explode on them uh, and basically kill them. Um, or it can do massive damage. And when I say massive, it's very significant. We're talking 4d6 per shot. Uh, it does specify that because they're untrained in it, they're going to have to do it at a lower die. So it should be at a D16 for most of them, which means they'll probably miss a lot of the time, uh, to be fair. Now, uh, the next room that you have is going to be the menagerie, and this is going to have some different creatures in it. This is something that I'm not a huge fan of whenever it just says uh, it's going like uh, re refer back to the refer back to the, the core RPG book for the stats on it. I mean, of course we own the core RPG and it's like, it's just an extra step for us to do. I personally would have appreciated for them to just print it, particularly in this case where it says uh, you've got a three headed tiger stats as per giant beetle, but with 3d, 3d 20 action die and no special properties. So I would have just pref preferred a new printing of just, Hey, this is the stat block for it. That's, you know, small criticism, it's really not that hard to look up. I did it, but still. 
It's just my take on that. Um, you have some new monsters here, of course. Uh, you have the Anthro Antis, which is a an ant-human hybrid kind of creature. Uh, and basically once they enter this room right here that has these creatures, then these force fields are going to start deactivating and they're going to have kind of round after round of fights that can play out. Uh, an owlbear is going to jump in on it. Um, and a Dobinman, which is a half walrus type human creature, uh, can join in on it. It doesn't really say what their disposition is, but I don't see why they would be inclined to fight because they seem... Uh, rather sentient. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't see why they'd want to fight. So in any case, uh, one of the things that is very much going to stick out uh, to most people is the time pad. So basically the players have the potential to step onto a time pad. And if they stand on it for a moment, then it will take them to a prehistoric era in a very steaming dun uh, dungeon jungle. And the only way to get back is to have a little time tagger rifle that they would find in that room as well. Um, there, it actually doesn't say where in the room it it is sitting, which, you know, my personal pet peeve, I would have liked for them to have that uh, in the box text or something like that. Uh, other, because I think it's possible that some people may forget to state that it's there. And then it might not be the player's fault that they're stranded in prehistoric land forever, basically, because it's the only way to get back. Um, it just it just takes them there. So you need to be okay with the fact that they may end up in another time and place. You can, of course, change it however you like. Uh, I think it would be fun to have them be stranded there and just have a prehistoric campaign. Um, I think it'd be really cool. It's something that you should embrace if you're interested in that kind of thing and if they are prehistoric campaigns are a whole different ball of wax than fantasy uh though so anyway um basically there's a limited amount of shots in that time tagger rifle that they can use to shoot themselves or each other and have them uh warp back to the place but somebody's got to push the button on the rifle to warp them back and they have to be able to understand it in order to do it. So understanding technology is not something that they're automatically able to do. It recommends a DC 15, I think, uh, intelligence check on the time tagger or it might be 18 or 20, uh, 20. Um, so they may take some time to figure it out. Now, Basically, one of the things that is going to happen, and it is whenever you feel like it's appropriate, is that this place is going to start blowing up. Uh, the auxiliary power is going to start crushing down, and they things are going to change in the place. One of the things that I have not mentioned thus far is that there is a T-Rex display in one of the rooms that is being held by a stasis field. If one of the players happens to stick their hand in the stasis field, they are caught in stasis as well. Somebody has to try and pull them out. But uh, that T-Rex is absolutely alive. And the moment that the power cuts out, the T-Rex is loose. So there are a lot of things that are going to shut down. These lift tubes that, that change gravity and let them float up or down to get from place to place, they shut down. From that point on, they have to find their own way of safely traversing up or down through the tubes to get to the different floors. And really, it's not a long trip for them to get out, but they're going to have to worry about that thing. So the power plant is going to explode. They have 10 minutes to evacuate the complex. So at that point, you should be keeping very close track of every round. Um, the way that you track rounds in this is they're going to have 60 rounds to escape. And so just keep very close track of what they're doing exactly. And I, for me, I would just have three little D20s on there and then just start counting up. And once all of them get up to 20, then there you go. Uh, if you have a D30, even better, which you, you may have a couple D30s, but probably not a whole lot. So um, again, if they have comprehend languages spell, which, you know, again, is something that they probably don't have unless they have multiple wizards and they just happen to luck out. Uh, with one of their random spell rolls, then uh, they can they can tell that the place is going to collapse. Most of the time, people kind of get the hint whenever the lights change and all that kind of stuff. So there are a lot of things that are going to change. So the the gravity fields are going to go down. Um, the uh, lift tube A is going to be filled with flames, which basically cuts off the path 
in a lot of places. Uh, there really is, for the most part, only one way for them to go out. It's just a matter of, do they take it seriously? So whenever I first read the adventure, I thought, wow, that's really not a whole lot of time. Uh, they could be really screwed. And coincidentally, one of the player characters almost got everyone else killed in my playthrough because of the fact that he was stunned by one of those fields. You know, basically the uh, auxiliary power kicked on. Uh, the fields uh, are still going and he was trying to reach in and grab one of the treasures that he wanted. He got stuck. He got um, uh, paralyzed by it for 10 minutes. And of course, this was 10 minutes after the 10 minute countdown started. So he would have been, they would have had to carry him the entire way out. Fortunately, the player who was the cleric realized that he had the potential if he rolls high enough on his lay on hands to cure him of that paralysis. He did so and they managed to get out with plenty of time to spare. Really all they have to do is they have to work their way back out into the room where the Yeti is, which uh, hopefully Actually, uh, they they necessarily have to go in that room in order to uh, get the silver uh, the silver disc. Um, which this is something to point out. In order to get the silver disc, they have to pull this box out of this uh, ice. Uh, which, if they don't do that, then they're going to be kind of screwed for quite a while until they figure out, hey. Let's go pull that box out and see what's in it. But typically, whenever you lay out a room description, which it's in the box text, so it, as long as they're paying attention, then they're going to get it. And you know, it will say that there's a, a you can see a box that is buried. They will unearth it. They will open it. They will find the disc. It'll attach themselves to to them, and they'll be able to open the door to get uh, to get to that point. But um, the once that when they're in that room, they can see that there is an exit that goes to the light of day, and that's the reason why there's a t there's a ton of uh, things that telegraph that there is an opening in that room. Basically, there's ice all over the place uh, in the room outside of it, which is a um, a four way uh, room that they they have to traverse in order to get to any really significant place. So they're going to know basically is what I'm trying to say in a roundabout fashion. So here you can see, uh, that once they crawl out, you know, they're, they, it's up at an angle, 45 degree angle, and, um, it can be kind of difficult to climb out and it can be hazardous, but they're probably going to manage. Um, with my group, they use a lot of really smart things. They also had spider climb when it came to the climbing thing, and that really helped them out. So what you see here is the primitive occupations table. Now, this is leading into people that want to run this as a zero-level funnel. And, I mean, it's exactly what it looks like. It's just a really cool way to just have uh, prehistoric level zero characters. So you can just have a campaign that is featuring those kinds of characters and work them in on the whole thing. It Now, here is the map of the whole layout of the place. Uh, as you can see, there is, this is the, the, the first place they start where they can go up the, the goat paths to get up there where they, they'd encounter the saber tooth or they can crawl straight up and go through the, this, the tubes right here that will lead them into this room right here, basically. And that's kind of where the whole adventure kicks off or they can crawl. They can take this all the way to the top and then they can actually go down the crevasse and get into uh, the room with the Yeti and just take it from that direction. Either way, it works. So you have multiple avenues to enter, which I always appreciate. I love whenever that happens, but I like how you have this sideways map to give you that perspective. You have above, uh, you know, bird's eye kind of maps. Again, slightly isometric, so you get a little, little bit more detail in the layout and stuff like that. Um, you have everything is nicely labeled, a lot of cool art. Um, very, very, very easy to just look at the map and say, this is exactly what you see. And I love that. It's, you know, top notch, really. Um, you even have these labels here, any palm disc, either one will open this or that, that kind of thing. Those things are really nice. Here you see the Anthroantis, which was the, the new creature. Um, 
Now, once you get through all of that, here you have the mini campaign setting. So what, what I really like about this is this is, it's not in tremendous detail. This is really just like, hey, if you really wanted to run a mini campaign, uh, this this is just a primer on what you would do with it. Base in, in you know this is it, you have you have clearly uh, a pretty nice map here with different regions to work with. Which each of these regions has uh, some brief descriptions included with what kinds of things are going on in these places. And basically, what you have is a prehistoric world ish that is actually post apocalyptic in a lot of ways. You have ruins that are all over the place here. Uh, he calls them Hyperborean ruins, and it's a callback to uh, something that he did in a previous module, um, which kind of encourages you to buy that one. It's uh, the holiday 2013 one, The Old God's Return, which I'm just going to flat out say that is a module that I quit running halfway through because I was frustrated with it uh, just because of how linear it was. But I have particular issues when it comes to stuff like that. That being said, it did have some cool ideas in it. And if you have it, then you can pilfer that stuff to influence what your Hyperborean ruins are like. Otherwise, you know, you just have a place that's full of these ruins and there's some vague descriptions as to what they are. There's a lot of cool information about what kind of uh, what kind of plants are here, what kind of animals are here, what's going on. Like when when does it turn green? Pretty much just for a very brief time in the summer. Everything else is going to be pretty much permafrost, icy rivers, and things like that. Um, after reading this, I had a very quick thought of you know this is what I would put for my wilderness encounters uh, in this area or this area or this area. It has a history of the area. It has a gazetteer with all of your different main locations and what is what exactly is going on there. It talks about these lights in the sky that actually um, people have noticed that uh, whenever those occur, that if people are pregnant during that time, that people have mutations and that those children are left out in the elements and some of them survive and you have mutants roaming the wilderness. There's just a lot of really cool stuff here. It's not terribly in depth, but it's not supposed to be. It's just giving you a lot of stuff that you can work with if you want to just start a campaign there and then have the uh, frozen in time module be just like a really cool dungeon crawl for them to 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 do during all of that stuff you know so here you have some adventure seeds that i think are quite neat you know you have uh for instance a huge rusting relic is discovered in the chill bogs during the spring thaw could this be one of the legendary airboats it is said the hyperboreans once sailed the skies in exploration inside the corroded hulk leads to information pertaining to an ancient mystery and forgotten riches in Aurum Ush, Ush. So you have a lot of stuff kind of feeding into each other. It's not lengthy or anything like that, but it's something to get your mind jogging. And I really appreciate that. I think it'd be fun to flesh that out uh, and make it yours. And that's pretty much it. Here you have the back and it is again twenty dollars. So that is frozen in time. Ultimately, do I think it is worth purchasing? I think if you love science fiction type stuff, uh, especially if you like your some peanut butter with your chocolate, as far as fantasy with your science fiction. Which I mean, if you're a DCC fan, then let's be let's be clear, you probably do. Then this is going to be right up your alley, very likely. Um, this is. Fairly, uh, as far as like how open this place is, I mean, you you it literally has a sandbox included for you to work with if you wish to do that. Uh, the adventure in and of itself is fairly straightforward, but it's not oppressively linear uh, in a lot of ways. I would, like I said, I'd probably add a few things so that they can learn a little bit more about what happened to the place, what kind of, what kind of stuff this dude was up to and all of that, just because sometimes players like to learn those kinds of things and they really don't have an opportunity for that here. But, uh, I very much appreciate the way that this place, it feels like a living, breathing place. Things change as they're going through it. Um, it just, it feels very alive and there's a lot of cool stuff in it. Maybe add some wandering monsters if you want to, just to keep them moving, uh, but there's plenty of stuff for them to do without that. It's just a matter if if you want to keep the tension up. So ultimately, 
I think it's a very cool module. I highly appreciate it. Um, you might like it. So check it out if you're interested. I know that this is actually a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but here we, here we are. So that's it for today. Hope you have a wonderful day. Take it easy.